If you have $10,000 or more in debt, before you go out and declare bankruptcy, try this first. Being in debt can feel like you're in a sinking ship because all of your energy is going into not sinking. And in that situation, there are three things that you need to do. Number one is you got to plug the hole. Number two is you got to get the water out of the ship. And number three is you got to steer your ship away from any more storms. That's exactly what you need to do right now, especially if you have large amounts of debt. Number one is you got to plug the money hole. You got to stop getting deeper into debt. Number two is you got to get the debt out. Once you stop going deeper into debt, that's when you got to come up with the right system or the right strategy to pay down your debt as quickly as possible. Because yes, there are some strategies that will allow you to pay down your debt faster than others. And then third, once you do that, you got to steer yourself away from this financial storm and make sure you never end up in that financial situation again. So starting with number one, how do you plug the hole? And this is where I think Dave Ramsey has a great method, which is essentially if credit cards got you into the debt in the first place, cut up those credit cards. Now, I love credit cards. I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit. I only spend with my credit card. But if you have credit card debt, you have to stop the source of the pain. You have to stop the source of the money outflow. And if that is a credit card, that means right now you got to cut up your credit cards that we don't have a chance to go deeper into credit card debt. Because the biggest mistake that so many people make when they start to realize, okay, I got to pay down my debt. I need to get my finances in order is you take one step forward, two steps backward. You start working to pay down your debt. Then your car breaks down. Now you got to spend $700 on your credit card to fix that car payment. And now you go deeper into debt because... Well, you don't have the cash put aside to take care of that card. So now what you need to do is number one is you got to cut up the credit cards. And also you want to make sure you have a little bit of cash put aside that way you can protect yourself against financial emergencies. But focusing on the debt, you got to cut up the credit card and plug the hole. That way you're no longer going deeper into debt. If you have any sort of high interest debt and you're also investing your money in the stock market, it might make more sense. In fact, it probably will make more sense for you to stop investing your money into the stock market and pay down this high interest debt first because this high interest debt is skinning you alive. Let me just talk about some investment opportunities. Let me give you an example. If you can invest $100 a month and you do this for 40 years, and you get a 20% return on your money, this $100 a month investment will grow to over $10 million. This is why investing is powerful, because you can turn this $100 a month investment into $10 million. Now, naturally, you're going to say, wait, just breathe, I'm confused. How am I supposed to get this 20% return, and why would I not want to invest my money to get these returns? Well, you're right. Getting that 20% annual return consistently is extremely difficult. But do you know who's doing it year after year after year? Your credit card companies. And so now when you are in credit card debt, you are the person that's compounding money, that's compounding wealth. Not for you, but for the credit card company. And this is where you need to make yourself rich before you make your credit card companies rich and everybody else rich. So right now, when you're working to invest your money into the stock market or the real estate market or whatever industry you're investing your money, you might be trying to get a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% return on your money. Historically, the S&P 500 stock market has grown by 7 to 10% a year on average. Some years a little bit more, some years a little bit less. If your credit card is charging you 15 to 25% a year in interest you're going to get a guaranteed return by paying down the credit card versus a potential return that's less in the stock market. And this is where right now, if you have high interest debt, you are going to get a better return by paying down the high interest debt because right now your money is compounding, not for your wealth, but for somebody else's wealth. Second, when you're trying to plug the money hole, the next thing you got to do is when you go out and spend money, you really have to know the difference between being able to afford something and being able to buy something. Because when the majority of people think that they can afford something, what they really think is, I can afford the monthly payments. Because now when you want to go out and buy a new iPhone, you want to go out and buy a new laptop, you want to go out and buy a new desk, you want to go out and buy a new TV, most people are not thinking of it in terms of now paying the full $1,500 to buy that TV or that desk or that laptop. They're thinking of, I can afford the $75 a month payment. That's you being able to buy it. It's very easy to be able to buy things. Buy now, pay later has made being able to buy whatever you want one of the most accessible things in the world. And I want to tell you a little bit of an insider story on this because I invest in startups. And I love working with fintech companies. Fintech companies are financial companies that work in the technology sector. 
And over the last number of years, the one industry that has boomed faster than every other industry, even in fintech, was, you want to guess, buy now, pay later, or as I like to call it, broke now, broke later. And the reason why it has boomed so much is because people love this idea of being able to buy things without having to pay the full price today because you don't feel that full pinch. You don't feel that full pain. Now, the pitch with buy now, pay later is you don't got to pay any interest. But now let's think about this for a second. Anytime you want to go out and borrow money, whether it's for a mortgage or a credit card, if you want to go out and borrow money, there's a cost to borrowing money, right? If there's a cost to borrowing money, how can buy now, pay later be this charity service that's so profitable that has been booming in valuations? Well, it's not a charity. And the reason why they've been booming so much is because, well, they might say they don't charge you any interest, but they have other ways that they make money. First, they know that when you buy something with buy now, pay later, or broke now, broke later, you are going to go out and buy more stuff. This has statistically been proven. Because now, when you don't have to pay the full price for the TV, what are you going to do? You're going to buy now, pay later the TV. You're going to buy now, pay later the sofa. You're going to buy now, pay later the sound system. And now all of a sudden, you have a whole new living room full of stuff, expensive stuff that you would not have bought if you would have just paid the full price up front. So number one, you're going to buy way more things. So now companies get to sell more stuff. They get to push more of their items out of the door. And number two is they also know is that a lot of people are not going to finish making the payments in the six months, the nine months, or the 18 months that you have to make the payments. And so now it's 0% interest, or so you think, and then comes month 18, you haven't finished making the payments, and now you get slapped with a big fine. And we're not talking about 5% APR or 10%. Now you're going to be paying 29 or 35% in interest because you didn't make the payments off in time. And this is why buy now, pay later, or broke now, broke later is so profitable for them, and it keeps so many people broke today. So yes, if you want to be able to buy something, that's fine. Just make sure you can actually afford it. And afford it means you can afford the full price, not just be able to make the monthly payments. And this is especially now when we're talking about consumer goods, liabilities, things that don't make you any money. Because guess what? That TV isn't putting any money in your pocket. That TV is an asset. An asset is something that makes you money. That TV is an asset for somebody. It's an asset for the store. It's an asset for the TV manufacturer. But it's a liability for you. And so somebody else's asset is your liability. And now what you need to be doing, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but you need to be putting your focus on buying more assets for yourself. But before you do that, you need to get rid of these liabilities. You got to get rid of the expenses and get rid of the money hole that has this money just flowing out of your ship. And the way that you do that right now is by no longer going deeper into debt. That means no longer going deeper into the buy now, pay later system. Avoid the buy now, pay later. Avoid the 0% APR, which was also my third point. I kind of cheated. I talked about two and three together because number three was 0% APR, which you kind of know my example now because I already talked about it with buy now, pay later. But we covered a lot of this in Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter. Because in that newsletter, not only do we keep up with what's going on in the financial markets, but we also talked about the industry of buy now, pay later from the fintech side, how that industry has been booming, how people make money with buy now, pay later. So if you are interested in keeping up with what's happening in the financial world from the housing market to the stock market to the crypto market to the global economy to our own economy, Market Briefs is a free newsletter that you can read. If you want to join Market Briefs, you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. The fourth thing that you need to do now, if you really want to plug the hole, is now that you understand the difference between being able to buy something to be able to afford something is what can you actually afford to buy? Because now the next thing is, okay, I want to buy these $100 pair of shoes. Before it was, I only needed $20 because I can buy now, pay later or 0% APR or put it on my credit card. We're not doing that anymore. Now it's, I want to buy this $100 pair of shoes. I got $100 in my bank account. Can I afford this $100 pair of shoes? And this is where the answer is no. Because now, if you really want to build wealth, you can't keep spending all of your money. This is what I call net zero thinking. And this is what keeps so many people broke. And I have seen this happen in so many instances. Because now when you want something, you're going to find a way to get it. 
And when you think in terms of net zero, which is how our system works, our society, the American economic system runs on a consumerism society, which is built on spending. Hate it or love it, that is what it is. Now, if you understand this, you can benefit from it. If you don't understand it, you're the one that's paying the price. Our American economic system is built around spending money. And most people think in terms of spending. When people get $1,000, they think, what can I buy with $1,000? If I can make an extra $10,000 a year, what can I buy with this extra $10,000 a year? If I won $100,000, what would I buy with this extra $100,000? What kind of car could I buy? What kind of vacations could I buy? We think in terms of spending. And now when you think in terms of spending, you assume that if I have $1,000 in my bank, I got to go out and spend $1,000 because I have $1,000 of spending ability. And this is the mindset that you have to break right here, which is now the simplest way to do this is to follow something like my rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. So now you go to the store, you've got $100 in the bank, you wanna buy the $100 pair of shoes. Now, before you would've been like, heck yeah, I can afford this. $20 a month payments, I can afford the whole shoe, I can afford it. No, that is broke thinking. We're now gonna be thinking in terms of wealthy thinking. So now, if you wanna afford, afford, afford that $100 pair of shoes, now you need $500 in your bank account to be able to afford the $100 pair of shoes. This way, now you're not spending all of your money and you cannot do the net zero thinking. And yes, this is gonna become very difficult because now you're gonna have to cut back on some of the things that you buy. If you wanna go out and buy these nice things that you don't need, yeah, you're gonna need more money to buy them. You wanna go out and start flexing, you're gonna need more money to do that but it's gonna keep more money for yourself, which will allow you to make yourself rich. Remember, asset versus liability. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket. When I go out and I invest my money into a stock or into real estate or into this thing, this thing is making me money. I own investments that pay me. When I go out and I spend $100,000 on a rental property, this $100,000 that I went out and spent is paying me every single month. If I took that same $100,000 and I bought a brand new car, a new BMW, that BMW would look nice, but that BMW would be losing value each and every day. That BMW would be eating up the premium gas. That BMW would have expensive insurance. That BMW is gonna have expensive maintenance. And on top of that, the value of the BMW is gonna be dropping, dropping, dropping. So when I go out and buy that car, it looks nice, but it's a liability. It's making the BMW company rich and made the salesperson rich, but it's keeping me broke. When I go out and I buy something like a rental property, now I'm getting paid month after month after month after month after month. And if I buy it in a good area, the value of my real estate is also going up, but that's not why I buy it. I'm buying for the cash flow. And now if I do this correctly, I have the money coming in to go out and buy a car and I don't have to work for it anymore. See, most people are working to drive a faster car. Most Americans work to have nicer things. Wealthy people work to have more assets. Assets are things that you buy for the purposes of making you money. Now, the nice thing is you don't need a ton of money to start investing in assets. You can start investing with as little as a dollar nowadays thanks to the new technologies out there but you just have to get started and it starts with your mindset with what's between your ears because if you spend all your money, you're never gonna have the opportunity or the ability to invest in assets because you have no money to invest because you kept spending all of your money. You kept having this net zero thinking and this is where now we have to break that before we can take the money out of the ship. We're talking about now how do we pay down your debt? Well, the first thing you do before you even start paying it down is you gotta stop the problem that caused the debt in the first place. And that's why now we gotta plug the hole and that means you're not gonna go deeper into debt. You have to control the spending before you can actually fix the debt. That's why right now we're so focused on the mindset side. And this is where now that rule of five will help you understand the difference between being able to buy something and being able to afford something. And the last thing now to plug that ship that will help you understand this, to tie it all together, is to understand the difference between a need versus a want. Because you need a car to get to and from work. You just want a BMW. You need nice clothes to wear to your job. You just want Gucci. You need a home to live in. You just want the 3,500 square foot house. You need food to eat. You just want to shop at Whole Foods. And this is where now you have to understand that difference between a need and a want. And when you're trying to now plug that hole, you're going to have to really dig in and see what do you really need and strip that down. Because when you have large amounts of debt, when you start stripping this down and you start getting rid of some of the wants, which you thought were needs, 
now you're going to start freeing up some more cash. And that's going to allow you to pay down that debt much quicker. But most people are so focused on just what's the best debt payment strategy, debt snowball, debt avalanche. But if you don't start with the basics, if you don't start with the mindset, if you don't start with plug in the hole, it doesn't matter which strategy that you do. It's going to take you forever to pay down that debt. And this is where, yeah, it's a lot harder to make that sacrifice. You're going to have to put in more work. You're going to have to put in more time. And people are going to look at you like you lost your mind when you go from a BMW to a Toyota Corolla. But when you do it the right way and you take that extra money that you no longer have to pay for the insurance, because have you ever seen the insurance payment on a BMW or the maintenance cost on a BMW versus a Toyota? Now you save that money and you can use this money now to build your wealth. But in this case, pay down the debt. And I'm going to talk about how you build wealth versus pay down the debt. I'm going to get to all that in this video. I'm jumping ahead of myself. But this is where right now, what you need to do is plug the hole so money stops leaving out of the ship. The easiest way to build wealth is to stop letting the money leave. That way now you have the money to build your wealth. And right now, that means you're no longer letting the money to leave. That way you have more money to pay down your debt. So step number one, we just plug the hole. It starts with what's between your ears and then it's what you do with your money. Now money is going to stop leaving and this is going to be painful because people are going to look at you like you lost your mind when you stop going to Cancun for the vacations, when you stop going to Benihana's every Friday night for dinner and when you stop going out and driving the BMW, people look at you like you lost your mind but at least you're going to have a bigger bank account. Now that you have plugged the hole, that's when you can move to number two, which is how do you get the water actually out of the ship? How do you get the debt out? What's the best and fastest way to actually pay down the debt? Now you can start looking at different debt pay down strategies. Dave Ramsey talks about the debt snowball method. You have the debt avalanche method. What the debt snowball method is, is you're going to pick out all of your different debts now, and you're going to lay them out from the smallest debt size so the $200 debt, the $2,000 debt, the $20,000 debt, you're going to lay them out. You're going to ignore the interest rate. And now you're going to start attacking each debt individually, but you're going to start with the smallest debt amount. You're going to ignore the interest rate. You're going to start with the smallest debt amount first. You're still making the minimum payments on everything, but you are going to attack the smallest amount first. The whole idea here is you're going to get those psychological wins because when you pay down one debt, you feel like you won. Now you go to the next debt and then you start attacking that. And you, again, you're ignoring the interest rates here. The alternative is what's called the debt avalanche strategy, which is now you're going to lay down one debt, the second debt, the third debt. You're going to lay down all of your debts and you're going to lay them out by the highest interest rate first. So you're going to lay out the 24% interest rate first, then the 12% interest rate, and then the 6% interest rate. And now you're going to ignore how much money each debt has, and you're going to pay down the highest interest rate first. Now, the advantage with the debt avalanche is financially, you generally will save more money over the long term because now you're attacking the higher interest rates first with the debt avalanche. But from a psychological perspective, what Dave Ramsey says is more people are likely to stick with the debt snowball method, meaning attacking the smaller balances first even though it might cost you a little bit more, you'll actually stick with it because psychologically you feel like you're winning. I don't really care which one you pick. You got to know you. For me, I am a numbers person. So to me, the avalanche method makes more sense to me because I know I'm disciplined. When I'm financially disciplined, I will do whatever it takes to hit that financial goal. If you don't feel like you have that financial discipline, go with the debt snowball. It does not matter. The biggest thing is that you stick with it and you got to know yourself but you have to know what's going to be right for you. And then the question is, how can you use little tricks to help you pay down this debt much faster? Because the next thing that you can do is you figure out the right strategy. That's noble debt avalanche. That's the irrelevant part. You figure out what's the right strategy and then you start paying down your debt. But then the next thing that you can do is how can you be more aggressive? And the simplest thing that you can do here is instead of paying your payments once a month, is you take a monthly payment, let's say your monthly payment is $2,000. You divide it up into two. So now it's not $2,000, it's $1,000 twice. Now instead of paying $2,000 a month, you pay $1,000 every two weeks. Now this might not seem like a big difference, but what ends up happening now is instead of making that $2,000 payment 12 times in a year, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make a half payment 26 times in a year, which means you're gonna make 13 full payments. 
because now what's happening is every four weeks, you're paying $1,000. And over the course of the year, instead of paying 2,000 times 12, which is $24,000, you're gonna pay 2,000 times 13, which is $26,000. So you just added a whole nother monthly payment without even thinking about it because now you're paying every two weeks instead of every month. That's the first thing you can do. So now when it comes to paying down the debt, now you've figured out that snowball versus debt avalanche. Now pay every two weeks instead of every month. That way you can attack your debt even more. Then the third thing is you're going to combine what we did with plugging the hole with here, which is now you are going to work to have more money to pay down the debt. Because this is where now it's just a simple math problem. If you have $10,000 worth of debt, you need $10,000 plus interest to pay down this debt as fast as possible. Now, you could come up with the best strategies in the world, but until you can come up with that money, you're not going to be able to pay down the debt. So how do you get that money? Well, you can either spend less money or you can work to earn more money. When we talked about how to plug the financial hole, we talked about different ways to spend less money. You are no longer spending money on things that you don't need. You are no longer going to buy things that you cannot afford. Now, you're also not going to spend all of your money. You're not thinking in terms of net zero. This way, you have more money. This is the most accessible way, not the easiest way, but the most accessible way to have more money. Now, when you have this more money, what do you do with it? If you have that high interest debt, this is where now you need to be paying down that debt as fast as possible. So now, if you don't need it, you don't spend it. Now you take the money that you're not spending because you don't need it and you have more money. Now when you have this more money because you work to spend less, now you're going to take this money and you're going to attack your debt with it. And this is where now you're going to work to pay down the debt. And now when you pay your debt payments in advance because you're going to have extra money to pay it down, you also want to make sure that when you're doing this, you're sending the extra money to your bank or to your credit card company, that your money is going to your principal balance not to make the next month's payment. And this is something you definitely want to make sure because when you are working to pay down the principal balance, you're actually paying down the amount of debt that you owe. If you owe $10,000 worth of debt and you send in an extra $1,000, well now that debt goes from $10,000 to $9,000 and you don't have to pay interest on that. That's what you want. But when you go to pay your next month's balance, now what you're doing is instead of bringing down your debt balance, you're just making your future payments. So you're still paying interest out of the extra $1,000 that you sent in. That's not what you want. When you're working to pay down that debt, you want to pay down the actual principal balance. You want to attack that instead of just making your future payments with the extra money. So make sure now when you're working to send in that money that you figure out what that money is actually going towards. You want to pay down the principal balance. Then the next thing you got to do, so we've talked about now how to spend less money. The next thing that you got to do is you got to figure out how you can earn more money. Now, the first way you can earn more money, which is, again, the most accessible, not the easiest, definitely not the easiest, but the most accessible is to just sell some of your stuff. If you got a BMW sitting in the driveway and you got credit card debt, your priorities are in the wrong place. Now, I know this is going to be hard and painful because I like cars too, but you got to get rid of the BMW because that is bleeding, costing you a lot of money. And it's not just the car payment, it's the insurance, it's the premium gas, and it's the maintenance and everything in between. You got to get rid of that flashy stuff, whether it's the cars, whether it's not going out on vacations, but we're talking about selling things, whether it's getting rid of some of the expensive clothes, whether it's getting rid of some other expensive toys. Look around you. Are there things that you can sell that you can downsize? Maybe you downsize your home. Maybe you go from a home to an apartment. Maybe you go to a smaller apartment. This is not fun. But this is also not permanent. The goal here is to pay down this debt as fast as possible. That way you can get to building your wealth as fast as possible. That way now you're not compounding your credit card company's wealth. You're compounding your own wealth. That way you can start living in the bigger homes and have the faster cars sooner and not have to worry about the money. Because the mistake that so many people make, the reason why people end up in debt is because they want the nice things today. And this is where, well, you know, it's painful, but also helpful to understand what debt is. When you use debt, you're using tomorrow's income today. When you go out and you borrow $50,000 to go out and buy a car, or you go out and you borrow $5,000 in your credit card, you're using tomorrow's income, next year's income, and the years after that's income, and you're spending it today. And when you spend it on a liability, something that's not making you any money, like a car or clothes or vacations, that money is being spent and not earning you any money. And now you have to spend tomorrow's income, and the day after that's income to pay it back plus interest. That's what debt is. And when we have this economic system that relies and runs on people spending money, 
Well, it's very easy to fall into the trap of just spend, 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 spend because that's what everybody's doing. It's just normal. That's what everybody does. Who doesn't finance the car? Who doesn't have credit card debt? Who doesn't use buy now, pay later? That's what's normal. But if you don't want to be like everybody else, you can't keep doing what everybody else does. And so now when you're trying to pay down the debt faster, now what you got to do is you got to figure out how you can get more money so you have more money to pay down that debt because now you need more money today to pay for yesterday's purchases. And the fastest way to do that is to get more money. Now we talked about how to spend less. We talked about how to sell some of your stuff, but now you got to figure out how can you actually earn more money? And maybe that means you got to get a second job. Maybe that means you got to do something you don't like that we can earn more money. Maybe that means you got to create a side hustle. Maybe that means you got to work as a contractor. Maybe that means you got to work as a freelancer. Maybe that means you got to go out and start a business. Maybe that means you're going to have to go out and do something. That way you can get more money. But again, let's go back to the core. Why are you earning more money now? Because your goal isn't to earn more money so you can have a faster car or go on another vacation. Your goal right now, and this is the difficult part, you're going to be working to earn more money. But when you get that extra $2,000, you're not going to go out and buy something with it. You're not going to go out and invest that money. You're not going to go out and save that money. You're going to take that money. You're going to pay down this debt as fast as as possible, period. Now, of course, you do need to have some emergency savings there, but you need to attack this debt, especially if it's high interest debt, because this is debt that's skinning you alive. When you have these debts on your liabilities, you are compounding somebody else's wealth. That's the name of the game, because now that other person who you borrowed money from, that business who you borrowed money from is making money on you. And when you buy a liability, you're getting hit twice. When you buy a car with debt, now not only did you buy something that's losing value, but you have to pay interest on something that's losing value. It's a double whammy. And this is where right now you have to work to earn more money. That way you have the ability to pay down debt. And that's where now when you earn more money, you have to remember the reason why you're earning more money is so you can pay down the debt. So the first thing you did is you plugged the hole. That means you cut up the credit cards, you stop going deeper into debt, you're no longer buying things that you cannot afford, you're going to be looking into needs versus wants, you're going to be looking into assets versus liabilities so you don't keep spending on liabilities, you're going to be using the rule of five, that way now you don't keep going deeper into debt. Now immediately you're going to have some more cash, and now that brings you to number two, which is now how do you get the money out of the ship? How do you get the debt out? out. This is where you got to come up with the right debt payment strategy for you. You can look at the debt snowball method. You can look at the debt avalanche method. It doesn't matter which one you pick. You just got to stick with it. Now you start sticking with it. Now the next thing you can do is you can start paying your payments twice a month or two times every two weeks. You pay it every two weeks. You're going to make a payment. That way you can kind of just discreetly send an extra payment to whoever you owe your debt to. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to make sure that the extra payments that you're sending are going to the principal balance, not next month's payment. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to be working now to have extra cash. So we already talked about how you spend less money, that spending less is going to give you more cash so you can pay down the debt. Now you throw that money at your debt that we can pay down the debt faster. The next thing you can do is you got to sell some of your stuff. You downsize your car, you downsize your home, you sell some of your clothes, you sell what other, other junk that you have, that we have more cash, you free up this junk, turn it into cash, and you take this cash and you pay down your debt. Now, the next thing you do is you're going to work to earn more money. Maybe a second job, maybe you work to get a raise, maybe you work to get a promotion, maybe you work some overtime, you got to get some more money in your hands. Now, when you get this more money, again, you're going to take this money and you're going to attack your debt with it. Because now the goal is to pay down the debt as fast as possible because this debt is compounding somebody else's wealth while you need to be building your own wealth. Which then brings us to number three. You got to now steer the boat away from the storm. That way you never end up in this financial situation again. I was reading a study just the other day which says that the average, average American household has right around $6,000 worth of credit card debt. It has become so normal to finance things. And this is where, you know, you get into this debate where, oh, the cost of living is so high. That's what people have to finance things. And you're right. The cost of living is high. You're right. The cost of living has grown faster than wages. You're right. Sometimes this stuff is screwed up. You're right. Bankers take advantage of people. You're right. Corporations are in the business of trying to make a bigger profit. They're trying to sell more things. They spend millions, if not billions of dollars a year, trying to get you to open up your wallet and give them money. That exists complaining about it and blaming them is not going to fix the situation. 
This is when you have to get financially educated and understand this. And yes, make some sacrifices. That means you have to be willing to now live within your means. And yeah, that sucks. That means you're going to have to not be able to buy the things that you want today because in the system, in the society, everybody wants to have the things that they want today, even if that means you cannot afford it. And that means you might not have the coolest and the nicest things, but if you really want to steer yourself away from the storm and never end up here again, that means what you need to do right now is always live within your means. The simplest thing that you can do is follow something like my 75, 15, 10 plan, which says from for every dollar that you earn for here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you're investing and 10 cents is the minimum that you're saving. This way now, whether you're making $25,000 a year or $2.5 million a year, you're always paying yourself first. And by paying yourself first, I mean actually investing your money first, saving your money first before you go out and make everybody else around you rich. Because when you go out and you finance a brand new BMW, or when you go out and you buy some new Gucci, you are buying an asset for somebody else. It's a liability for you. It's losing money for you, but it's making somebody else rich. When you go out and you buy the BMW, you made the salesperson rich, you made the dealership rich, and you made BMW rich. When you go out and buy the Gucci, well, you're making Gucci rich, but it's at the expense of your wealth. Now, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. I want you also to hear this from me too. I want you to have the nice things. That's why we're all working so hard is so you can have all the nice things, have the freedom, and have the stuff that you want. I want you to be able to afford it first. That way you're not sacrificing your future wealth and your family's wealth and your generational wealth just so you can drive a fast car today. Because that fast car today is going to look cool, but eventually it's going to run out. You're going to want to get a new car. And then you're going to start the payments game all over again. And you're never going to have the opportunity to build wealth. And you're going to keep blaming everybody else. Because you're constantly playing the same game the same way everybody else is. You're running into that same wheels. You're working to earn more money. And you can't figure out why you can't get ahead. And the reason why is because every time you earn more money, you start spending more money. And this is where right now you got to cut out the crap. Get out the stuff that you don't need. And this is hard. I get it. You're going to have to make sacrifices. Nobody wants to talk about that. Everybody wants the six steps to six figures in six months. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it sells for a nice course on the internet, but it doesn't actually make you any wealth. And this is where right now, if you really want to build your wealth, you got to make the hard decisions. You got to sacrifice some of the things that you don't need. Then you got to work to earn more money. Then you got to pay down the debt. That way then... Once you do that, you never end up in this situation again. And now what you're doing is when you're earning more money and you're spending less money, you're doing it that way you can invest because your investments are what is going to make you wealthy. Your investments are what's going to allow you to have financial freedom. Your investments are what's going to buy you that ticket. That way you can live the life that you want. It's not going to be your savings. It's not your salary. It's your investments. But you can't build these investments if you're loaded up on debt because now your mind and your money is going to be going to pay down this debt, especially if it's high interest debt, which is where now you have to understand how to use the system to your advantage. Now, I said earlier in this video that I only use a credit card to make my purchases. And this is where I want you to understand why I only use a credit card to make my purchases. A couple months ago, I was shopping for an Airbnb and I found an Airbnb that I wanted. I'm actually recording this in an Airbnb right now, but I found an Airbnb that I wanted and I reserved the Airbnb. Now, what I didn't realize what was going to happen was they took a huge deposit, which I didn't really think that was a big deal because I was going to take that Airbnb anyways. The Airbnb was listed as a three bedroom. I needed a three bedroom Airbnb. And then that same day, as soon as I made that reservation, the host messaged me saying essentially that the third bedroom wasn't a real bedroom. It was just a den and it wasn't a real room. So that wasn't going to work for me. So I said, okay, uh, this is not the right Airbnb for me. I want to cancel the reservation. And they said, sure, you can cancel the reservation, but the $5,000 deposit you paid is non-refundable and you can't get that back. This was like a matter of hours of me making this quote unquote reservation. Now I was a little bit confused because number one, that's not what you advertised. Number two, I just made this reservation. And number three, there was no back and forth. I thought I was just reserving the days. Uh, so I just didn't understand why well, that process worked. So I tried to file for a refund. The host refused to give it to me. I talked to Airbnb. Airbnb said that they can't do anything because it was against the host's policies. Now, that seemed a little strange to me. So I called up my credit card company. I told them what was going on. And they said, don't worry, Mr. Singh, we'll take care of it. And that $5,000 deposit that I paid was refunded to me by my credit card company 
pretty soon. I don't know if it was a number of days, maybe it was a week, but it was pretty soon that they got that money from me back. And then the credit card company then went after Airbnb and they got that money back for me. So I like credit cards because credit cards offer a lot of perks. But if you have to pay interest on your credit card, you are using your credit card the wrong way and you are the one that's paying for everybody else's perks. See, credit cards are just a medium of exchange. When I go out and I buy something, if I wanna buy a microphone, a laptop, I wanna buy anything, I can pay it with cash, I can pay it with a debit card, or I can pay it with a credit card. I guess I could also pay with a check. But I like credit cards because, well, I know how to spend money. I'm very disciplined with my money. And credit cards give me perks. Now, I want to make sure I clarify this. I love Dave Ramsey. When I was getting started on my financial journey, I read first Robert Kiyosaki's books, then I read Dave Ramsey's books, and I loved Total Money Makeover, Entre Leadership. If you have not read those books, you have to read those books. Those are great books on now how to spend your money the right way. And when I read those books, I stayed away from credit cards for a long, long, long time because he scared the crap out of me out of using credit cards, which is great for many people. But as I started to go through my financial education journey, I realized I'm a very disciplined spender. I will not spend more money than I have or that I need to just because I get some cash back. But I also spend a lot of money. I mean, I have to spend a lot of money in my business. I have high expenses. I might as well get some perks for the expenses that I have to make anyways. And that's where having the right medium of exchange for me makes sense. For me, a credit card as a medium of exchange makes sense because now I get perks. The perks that I get is number one, I get cash back on every purchase that I make. Number two, I get spending protection, fraud protection, purchase protection, because if something happens, like I just talked about with the Airbnb situation, well, I can call up my credit card company and then I know that they'll take care of me. And I've had multiple issues in the past that I've talked about where I was scammed or where something happened and I did not get my product. I spent money and my credit card company was the one that then refunded the purchase where previously debit cards didn't do that for me. Now I know debit cards have become much more advanced in the last number of years since I first started using debit cards. But for me, when I first used debit cards, they didn't have all those features and I had lost a lot of money because I used a debit card. And then the third thing, especially once you start to travel more, is credit cards can also provide you with a lot of upgrades. Now, of course, it comes at a price. Like I pay a lot of money for my annual credit card fees for my annual upgrades and all that, like my um, Amex Platinum. I'm not sponsored by any of these companies. I'm just telling you what I use. Amex Platinum, I think it's like $700 a year or something. Everyone's trying to play the game of how do I get my $700 back? I, I really don't care. I'm not trying to get my money back. I like the luxury that it provides because the luxury for me is when I go to an airport because I travel a lot, I get access into the airport lounges. I get access to TSA PreCheck. They paid for my clear membership. Now when I go to the lounge, I can get there much quicker because I don't got to stand in the same airport line that I used to. I can just kind of run through the line quickly. Now I go into the airport lounge. I can eat. I can hang out there. I can do my work. Then when I get onto the plane, well, uh, sometimes I might get upgrades, but I don't think that really has much to do with the Amex Platinum. But then when I get to where I got to go, it gives me Hertz upgrades. It gives me Marriott upgrades. It gives me Hilton upgrades. Those things have value to me. So for me, it's worth the price. I'm not sitting here trying to play the game of how do I get my money back? And I know some people do, and that's fine if you do. But for me, it gives me a particular value. It gives me perks and things that I like. That's why I use a credit card. Again, I'm not going to spend money that I don't have. I'm never going to pay a penny in interest. If I was paying a penny in interest, this would absolutely not be worth it. The interest is not worth the perks. So if you're paying interest, you're paying for everybody else's perks. And this is where you have to understand how to use a credit card the right way. Because if you're using a credit card and now you're in credit card debt, you got to get rid of the credit card. You're using a credit card the wrong way and the interest will never, will never be worth it when you have to pay the interest to get the perks. I like credit cards because, well, when I make my purchases, I'm also getting cash back. And this cash back can be an investment bonus for me at the end of the year. It could be a way for me to just have a free vacation. It could do a lot of different things. I like those things. Now, when I use a credit card, I'm just going to be very transparent with you. Again, I'm not sponsored by any of these credit card companies. I'm just telling you what I use and what I do. I have three different general categories of credit cards. I have my personal cashback credit cards. I have my business credit cards. And then I have travel credit cards. I am not the best when it comes to travel or, or credit card hacking. 
I just don't spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So I'm going to be very honest with you there. I like cash back. So when I have my personal expenses, when I go out and I go pump gas or go get groceries or do my personal expenses, I'm just going to put that on my personal credit card, which is going to give me the best cash back. That's all I'm looking for, period. I don't really care about all the other stuff. I'm just getting cash back for my expenses because I, I like the cash back and I like the purchase protection, period. When it comes to my business, same thing. I have a separate sets of business cards for my businesses, my real estate investment businesses, entities, my businesses here, Briefs Media, Minority Mindset, all have their own credit cards. Now, those credit cards, again, my goal is just cash back. I have a lot of expenses in my business, whether it's advertising, whether it's softwares, technologies, everything in between. There's a lot of expenses that are needed. Put those on the credit card because I have to make those expenses as it is, but I get 2% cash back for every dollar that I spend. So if I spend uh, $100,000 over the course of a year, that's $2,000 in cash back for doing nothing except making the expenses that I had to make anyways with a credit card. The third thing are my travel credit cards. Now with these travel credit cards, I have fees on these cards. Now again, some people like to play that game of trying to hack the credit card. How do you get the best value out of it? For me, it's just a luxury. I pay for luxury things because it provides the value to me. The value to me with my travel cards is number one, getting access into the travel lounges, getting through TSA pre-check and clear, and then having access to upgrades, things like rental car upgrades, having things like hotel upgrades. I use those hotel upgrades a lot. I have spent a lot of nights in hotels in the past couple of years. And it's kind of funny because more than a couple of years ago, uh, well, I don't know how many years ago, we'll go back a number of years where I used to go. And when I used to go and try to find a hotel, the number one thing that I would look at is the price. Red Roof Inn, the whatever it was, the, the cheapest hotels that I could find on the side of the highway for $29 a night, $39 a night, maybe $49 a night. And then we'd pack as many people as possible into that one hotel room. I never cared about which hotel beds were there. I never cared about what the rooms looked like. I just wanted a place to sleep that wasn't going to cost me money. And then fast forward a few years, I, I remember this very vividly because it was the weirdest thing ever. My wife and I went to Chicago and we stayed in this place called the Embassy Suites. And this was like right around the time we had just gotten married and we stayed at the embassy suites. And I was like, dude, did I went to my wife and I was like, did you sleep okay last night? She's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, me too. I slept really good. Like I never slept good in hotel beds ever. And I was like, I slept, I fell asleep and I stayed asleep the entire night and I just woke up and I was like, I feel really good. She was like, yeah, that was really weird. Now, so that happened. Then we were getting a new mattress for our house and we were talking about which mattress to get. And it was kind of funny because I still remember the Embassy Suites bed. And I was like, dude, something was up with that bed and that mattress because I slept really good. So I, I true story, I called up the Embassy Suites in Chicago and I asked them which mattresses they have. The lady who picked up the phone, the receptionist, was really confused. And she was like, check our website. And we'll, what I realized was I wasn't the only one asking these questions. And I started realizing that Embassy Suites has their own line of mattresses that they use. And I saw that certain hotel brands, like hotels and Marriott's, carry a certain standard with which mattresses they use. So now, I was like, whoa, I did not know that. Some hotels really care about the sleep that their guests get. Now, me as a business person, as an entrepreneur, when I have a lot of things to do, it helps when I get a good night of rest. So maybe it's worth it for me instead of paying the $29 or $39 a night for the motel or hotel, for me to just pay the $200, $250 a night, $300 a night, maybe $500 a night, whatever it might be, for a nicer hotel room, that way I get a nicer bed. And before, that was like the craziest decision. Why the heck would I pay $300 a night for a hotel when I can get a hotel for $30 a night? It made no sense to me. But then I realized that the quality of your sleep matters. And that was when I realized, oh, it's kind of nice staying at nicer hotels, which didn't make sense to me before. And now with certain credit cards, you can also get free upgrades when you stay at some place like a Hilton or a Marriott. So for me, now because I like to get a good night of sleep when I go to a hotel, I like the upgrades because I would get more space. I have maybe sometimes a suite for free or for a free upgrade because I have that credit card. So that has value to me. But again, it has to be in the right stage of where you are in your career and in your life. And if you're in a stage in your career where you can't manage your credit cards, 
You can't spend your money correctly. You can't control your spending. Don't get a credit card. What are you talking about? It's not worth it. Stop spending money that you shouldn't because you think that it's a, a, a money printing piece of plastic. Stop that. Don't get a credit card. If now you feel like you are at a stage where you can control your spending, well, start by getting a free credit card. That's going to give you some cash back. That's going to give you that purchase protection. That's going to give you some of those rewards. Start doing that. As you start to grow, if you have a business, you can obviously get your own business credit card. But then as you, if you keep growing and you start to build more wealth and you start to travel more, well, then you can look at potentially getting a travel card for yourself as well. Now, there's travel cards that are free as well. I don't know too much. I'm not a travel card hacker, okay? There's other people on the YouTube that do it way better than I do. So I'm not going to sit here and try to do an analysis of credit cards here. But there are some free travel cards out there that will allow you to get some benefits without having to pay an annual fee. Some will be maybe $100. You know, it starts to kind of grow from there where you can find the right credit card for you. But it has to be at the right stage of where you are. If you're struggling to make your bills and now you're trying to figure out what's the best travel card to spend money on, you're looking at it the wrong way. First, control your spending. Then work to build your wealth. Start investing your money. Then, as you start to build that wealth, now you can start looking at things like luxury, right? Luxury is not, you don't start making money and then figure out, oh, what's the best luxury item I should get? No, you got to make money. You got to invest your money. You got to build your wealth. Once you build some wealth, now you can start looking at luxury. The mistake that so many people make is to start spending money on luxury before they even make any money. And that's what gets people so caught up into that system of getting into credit card debt or getting into debt is you want the nice things today before you have earned it. And luxury is great. It's awesome. It's nice to be able to sit and have comfort when you fly. It's nice to be able to have a nice rental car. It's nice to be able to have a nice hotel. But you got to do the things you got to do before you can get there. Don't sacrifice your wealth just so you can have a nice rental car or a nice hotel for two nights. Work your way there and figure out when is the right time for you to start spending money on the nicer hotels. And this is where, again, it goes back to just understanding you, what's important to you right now. First, work on controlling the spending, then work to earn more money, then work to invest that money, then work to build that wealth. As you build that wealth, now you can start looking for ways that you can start spending money differently, that we can start enjoying things and figure out what's enjoyable to you. Now, there's always this debate that you see on the internet between good debt versus bad debt. Bad debt is your consumer debt, the debt that you use to finance your liabilities, your, your car payments, your credit card debt. All of these things are bad debt. You buy now, pay later for your TV and your clothes. That's bad debt. And then you have people talk about the good debt, which is the debt that you can use to go out and buy a rental property. Because now, if you can borrow $100,000 and go out and buy a rental property that's going to make you money, this is good debt because now the $100,000 is making you money because now this $100,000 is buying an income producing asset. So that's good debt. $100,000 to finance a car, bad debt because that car is losing value and it's costing you money every single day. Now, the thing that I want to mention about this is there's no such thing as good debt. All debt is bad, but some debt can make you money. So the reason why I say not all, no debt is good debt is because that good debt can turn bad very quickly. And I've seen this happen many times. And this is where if you don't take care of that good debt, it's going to turn around and bite you very fast. And let me explain what I mean by this, because I've been a real estate investor for a long time now. And some of the best deals that I have gotten was when good debt turned bad. Now, it was good for me, bad for the person that used that quote-unquote good debt. Because now let's say you buy a property for a million dollars. You put in 25% as a down payment. You put down $250,000. You finance the other $750,000. Now, a few things can happen. Number one is the best case where you take care of the property, things go well, the property value goes up, and you start making more money, and you can make off, you can pay all the debt payments. That's great. But other things can happen as well. Let me talk about actually the way that the internet makes it seem. Because the internet makes it seem like this, that you go buy the million dollar property with 25% down, you put in $250,000, you finance $750,000, you put in some more work, you raise the rents, and now this property value goes up to $1.5 million because you did everything right. Now what do you do? You do a cash out refinance. Now you pull out $1.2 million. You have $300,000 worth of equity, you pull out $1.2 million to pay off your previous mortgage, and you put some money in your pocket. Now you have no cash in the deal. you got some free cash in your pocket. Now you can go out and have a nice car. You can go out and go on a nice vacation and have money to spend. 
and this $1.5 million property is now paying for your debt. But then what can also happen is the economy takes a turn for the worst, and then rents start to fall because, you know, people start losing their jobs, incomes fall, and now you have to cut rents. And now that you cut rents, you have less revenue coming in. And maybe you see a little bit more turnover because what tends to happen from my experience is that when bad things happen, bad things happen in groups. So now you see a couple of tenants leave, you have to lower some of your rents, and now your revenue has fallen. But your expensive has also written, risen because you have more debt on the property. And now you might be struggling to make some of the payments on the property, and now you try to sell because you're like, you know, I just want to get out of the deal. It's causing me a lot of headaches. You have $1.2 million with the debt. You can't find a buyer because you're in a recession. And now you're stuck. Maybe you can sell it for $1.2 million and get out easy. Maybe you can't find a buyer for over $1.1 million. And now you have to come up with $100,000 to sell it. Maybe the bank now comes in and takes the property away from you and you foreclose on it. And then they sell it for a discounted price. See, it was good debt. You were living high. It was all great. And then it turns around and bites you. Now, what I'm saying here is not that you shouldn't use debt, but rather understand debt and treat it as it should be. Debt is dangerous, whether it's bad debt or good debt, good debt. But that good debt can turn around and become bad very quickly, which is why if you're going to use debt, that's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Use debt if you want to help grow your investments, to grow your businesses, to do whatever it is that you want to do, as long as you understand the risk, but understand that it can be very bad. And you want to be very careful with that debt and treat it as it is, which is it's debt. And it can turn around very quickly because people can get high on this debt. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And you see this, especially in real estate. I've seen this many times in real estate, which is why I'm focusing on real estate, because people can get high off of their good debt, especially when the economy is booming, especially when property values are rising. You start to buy properties, refinance out, pull out your cash, pull out more cash, buy another property, do it again and again and again and again. And now you have this large portfolio of properties very over leveraged. Now, this can make people very rich when you do it the right way. But when you get greedy and you start using too much of the good debt, and now you start having all the nice things, right? You start having all the toys. You got to have the nice car because you're a great real estate investor. You got to have a big home because you're a big real estate investor. You got to have the nice vacations because, you know, you're a big real estate investor and you're using all this good debt. Well, when things turn around, because the reality is nothing can go up forever, things will turn around. You have up periods and down periods. The first person to lose their shirt are the people that have way too much good debt. So yeah, there is bad debt. Bad debt is when you use it to go out and finance things that don't make you any money. Your credit card debt is bad debt. Your buy now, pay later debt is bad debt. Your car payments are bad debt. That good debt might be making you some money, but that good debt can turn around and be bad just as fast. And this is where now understanding that cautiousness that some debt can make you money. Some debt can increase your wealth, but that doesn't make it good. You still got to treat it with caution because that good debt can turn around and become bad just as quickly if you do not watch it carefully. And that's where you want to be very careful with the amount of debt that you use and how you're using debt because obviously no more financing things that don't pay you that aren't making you any money that you do not need, period. No more financing the consumer liabilities, no more financing those consumer goods, period. Should you finance some of your investments? Sure. It can make you a lot more money. It can amplify your wealth. It can allow you to grow a lot faster. Nothing wrong with that. Use it. But treat it as it should be. Treat it with caution. Understand that debt is not to be played with. It is fire and it can burn you just as fast as it grew you if you do not treat it with that caution. Now, this is where it pays also to understand how all of this ties together with what's happening in our economy right now because we're seeing a big shift in the debt culture. The United States of America is facing the highest debt levels that we have ever seen, and now this bubble is starting to shift. Our national debt, the United States government, is approaching $32 trillion worth of national debt. And then if you look at our corporate debt, corporate debt levels are hitting also brand new record highs. And then if you look at household debt, household debt levels broke a brand new record in 2023. What's interesting is that debt levels really ballooned in 2020 and 2021 when we saw the lowest interest rates ever. When we saw those lowest interest rates ever, 
everybody wanted to take advantage of this cheap debt. We saw people who wanted to go into debt, buy a new home, buy a car. People wanted to take advantage of this debt. Businesses wanted to take advantage of this debt. That way they could grow and expand. So businesses loaded up on this cheap debt. And even our government loaded up on this cheap debt. You could see this through treasury bonds, treasury notes. The government started spending way more money. So even our government started loading up on all this cheap debt in 2020 and 2021, which exploded the debt bubble. It boomed to the biggest levels we have ever seen. Well, starting in 2022, the debt environment really started to change when the Federal Reserve Bank started to raise interest rates. And in less than 18 months, the Federal Reserve Bank or Central Bank here in the United States raised interest rates from 0% to over 5%, which is some of the fastest growth that we've ever seen in interest rates. Now, the reason why these higher interest rates matter for the debt levels that we have is because most debt is not a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. If you went out and you bought a home and you got a mortgage for 2.5% and you locked it in for 30 years, it does not matter what happens to interest rates because you are going to be paying two and a half percent for those 30 years unless you refinance. But if you don't refinance, you're locked in at two and a half percent. Well, most debt is not a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. For example, our national debt, our government debt is not a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. A lot of our national debt readjusts in one year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years, which means that every year now, the government has to pay more money in interest on the debt that it has because number one, it has a lot of debt. And number two, the interest rates have gone up so significantly. That's why we've been seeing the national payments, the debt interest payments from our government skyrocket over the last number of years. In fact, this decade, in the coming years, we are going to see the interest payments on our national debt exceed our entire defense budget, our entire military budget. We are going to be spending more money as citizens to pay down our debt than we are to fund our entire military. The reason why is because twofold. Number one, we have spent so much money as a government. We've printed so much money. We've spent so much money. And then number two, now, interest rates have gone up so significantly. And every six months, we're seeing a new chunk of our national debt readjust at the higher interest rates. So now when you have this $32 trillion with the national debt, well, when you're at 3% interest rates, it's not that big of a deal. But then when interest rates double to 6% or 7%, now it becomes a much bigger deal because now the payments start to rack up because now the amount of debt service costs you have to pay start to rack up. And the reason why this is significant to understand, I'm going to talk about the government first, and I'm going to talk about corporations from the government level is because how does the government fund its expenses? Well, they only have one source of income, you, me, taxpayers with tax dollars. And so when you pay money in taxes, the government generates its revenue. Now, when the government generates its revenue, it can pay for its things. It can pay for firefighters. It can pay for teachers. It can pay for police officers. It can pay for bridges. It can pay for its investments into wherever it wants to invest. And then also pay, it has to pay for interest, which means now as the debt servicing costs for the government rise, more and more of the tax dollars that the government generates have to go to pay down debt instead of investing into the country. And then the next issue is, well, what happens if the economy is slowing? Well, if the economy is slowing, that means well, people lose jobs, right? Because you see bankruptcies and you see layoffs. If people lose their jobs, that's less tax dollars going to the government because, well, when you get paid a salary, part of your salary goes to the government. If you're not getting a salary, then that piece of your salary is no longer going to the government. Plus, businesses have to pay taxes on their profits. And if businesses are making less money, their profits tend to shrink. And if profits are shrinking, their tax liabilities are also shrinking because they have smaller profits to pay taxes on. Same with investors. You pay taxes on profits, right? If you sell an investment for a profit, you have to pay taxes. Well, if asset values begin to fall because the economy is slowing, that means generally investors would be making less money. If investors are making less money, less tax dollars for the government. So now let's analyze this. If we see a slowing economy, kind of like we've been seeing happen, and the economy continues to slow, that would mean less tax dollars for the government. Okay, that's, you know, is what it is. But then it comes at a time where tax liabilities are rising, meaning 
the obligations of the government are also rising. Not just because the government is committed to do more things, but because the government has higher interest payments. Because now we've already seen the national deficit explode, we've seen the national debt explode. So the government has all this national debt that they have to pay interest on, and the interest payments are also rising. So you have the expenses of the government rising, while if we see a recession, the revenues are falling, which means more stress to pay these interest payments. Now, obviously, some people have proposed, why doesn't the government just print more money to pay off the interest payments? Well, that's like fixing the inflation by creating more inflation. So very dangerous slope to go down. Not something that is impossible, but something that you definitely want to be paying attention to because that's going to pose issues on our economy, pose stresses to our government in the coming years. So something you want to keep your eye on is the national debt and the interest payments, especially as tax revenues could potentially be falling. The next thing you want to pay attention to is what's going on on the corporate debt side, because the corporate debt levels have been ballooning over the last number of years. Now, we did a full deep dive of this in Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter where every day my team is breaking down what's happening in things like the economy, the housing market, the stock market, crypto, and the global economy. It's a fun, witty, and easy-to-read email. We can read it in less than five minutes every morning, and it will keep you up to date on what's happening, when it's happening, so you don't get blindsided by what's happening. So if you want to join Market Briefs, you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market, and I got the link for you down in the description below. So now, if you look at the corporate debt levels, what has happened in 2020 and 2021, even into 2022, is that corporate debt levels ballooned to the highest levels ever, which really isn't that surprising because interest rates were also at their lowest levels ever. So corporations saw it as an opportunity to go out and raise money. So corporations, startups, big corporations were borrowing money like crazy, which, okay, what did they do with the money? Now, some corporations took this money and they used it as an opportunity to invest into their company, right? Because if you can borrow money at 3%, well, you don't need that big of a return to make it profitable. And so corporations were investing like crazy. They were opening new stores, opening new manufacturing plants, investing in research and development, hiring more people. And then you also had the second side, which is corporations also use this money to buy non-income producing things. For example, stock buybacks. Because corporations saw the low interest rates, they said, well, we can also reward our shareholders, the investors. There's two ways that you can do that. You can pay out a dividend, which is a cash payment, or you can do a stock buyback, which is where you buy back the stock, which makes the stock price go up. Both of these things make the investors richer. Both of these things have their time and place. And both of these things also boomed in 2020 and 2021 and 2022. But what's interesting is what happened is we not only saw a record amount of stock buybacks in 2020, 2021, and 2022, but we saw a record amount of levered stock buybacks, meaning corporations were going into debt, not just to finance their manufacturing plants and hiring more employees and opening more stores, but so they can make their shareholders richer. So corporations would then go out and raise billions of dollars of debt, cheap debt, take this money, buy back their own stock, make the stock price go up, the shareholders get richer, and now the corporations have a lot of debt on their balance sheet, which isn't that big of a deal as long as you're making the money. Now, here we are today, and a couple things are happening. Number one, we're seeing the economy obviously start to slow down, which is hurting some of the revenues of businesses, but overall, okay. But then the second thing, like I was telling you just a minute ago, is most debts, including corporate debts, are not 30-year fixed-rate mortgages. And so now, over the coming 24 months, we're going to see a big chunk of corporate debts start to readjust. And if interest rates stay high, that means the corporate debt levels are going to really change because corporate debts are high. And then the interest payments, the servicing costs of these debts will also readjust because now you go from having a billion dollars of debt at 3% to a billion dollars of debt at 7%. There's a big difference in your monthly payments. Now, again, it's not that big of a deal when Revenues are growing and profits are skyrocketing, but when the revenues are falling and profits are shrinking and your expenses start to rise, that's a problem. And again, now if you used a business and you got debt to go out and invest in an income-producing asset, you opened a new manufacturing plant, you opened more stores, yeah, that's okay. You know what? Maybe this business is booming and even if debts readjust, you can get by just fine. 
But if you were a business and you just use this debt to enrich the shareholders, you use this debt to buy non-income producing assets like dividends and stock buybacks, you can start to see now where this could run into big issues where if your debts readjust and your incomes are not rising fast enough while your expenses are exploding because of the new debt servicing costs, that's going to put a lot of pressure on businesses in the coming 24 months. And it's not just corporations in this sense. It's also real estate, commercial real estate particularly. Commercial real estate, like corporations, don't generally have 30-year fixed-rate mortgages. And Morgan Stanley, I believe, put out a study where they said about half of the $3 trillion of commercial loans that are outstanding are going to readjust in the coming 24 months, about $1.5 trillion with the commercial loans. Well, again, what does that mean? Well, if you're a commercial real estate landlord and your expenses go up because your debt payments go up, generally it's not that big of a deal because what you would do normally is you're going to charge your tenants more. Now, this might be residential tenants, people that are living there. This might be offices. This might be in restaurants. This might be retail buildings. Like That's kind of the name of the game with commercial real estate is when your expenses go up, you charge more. That's just kind of how it works. Well, okay, that would be fine in an okay time. But what we're also seeing, in addition to all that, is a complete shakeup in certain sectors of the office real estate market. Because if you look across the country, many offices are sitting 50% vacant. Why? Because well, people are working from home, people are working hybrid. Now, of course, some companies are telling their employees to come back into the office, but still today, offices are nowhere near as full as they were back in 2019, which means now in the coming 24 months, we're going to see a lot of off or commercial real estate loans readjust, which means also that a lot of office loans are going to readjust in the coming 24 months. When those office loans come to readjust, the office landlords are now going to be stuck with higher debt payments, which, okay, if you can generate more revenue from the tenants that are there, the businesses that are paying your rent, fine. But if your building is sitting half vacant and now your expenses double, that's going to pose a lot of problems. And that's where you have a lot of people kind of closely watching what's happening in the office real estate market because if interest rates continue to stay high, that's going to put a lot of pressure on office landlords, maybe to sell, it could increase foreclosures, and that's where it can also create opportunities. Then we go to the households, right? We talked about the government national debt. We talked about corporate debt, commercial real estate debt. Then you also have the households. And on one hand, you have the 30-year fixed rate mortgages, not to mention the people that took advantage of the refinancing boom because home values skyrocketed in the last few years. So people refinanced and pulled out a lot of cash out of their properties, felt like they're rich. Well, if home values start to drop, you can see where that's an issue. But I don't want to talk too much about the housing market here because, you know, that's that's going to depend on a lot of different factors that this is already a long enough video that I don't want to go into that right now. But what I do want to talk about is, well, what about things like credit card debt? Because credit card debt is a variable interest rate loan. And credit card debt levels are hitting the highest levels we've ever seen in the United States. Now, part of the reason, obviously, is because of the high inflation that we've been seeing. And other parts of the reason is people want to be able to buy the things that they want with the credit card. So now as credit card levels are rising, while interest payments are also rising, that means, well, interest rates are rising, that means your interest payments also rise. Now, the reason why this is significant is because obviously a lot of households have been struggling because of the high inflation not just because of the slowing economy, but because of the high inflation. And now there are talks of student loan payments also restarting soon. Now we'll see what actually happens with student loans. This has been an ongoing discussion for the number, last number of years. But it looks like there's going to be some sort of decision being made with student loans soon, whether it's a pay down, which could cause inflation, or whether it's payments restarting. Now, I want you to think about this for a second, about what this means practically, because you have a big chunk of the country that has student loans that hasn't had to worry about making a single payment for the last three some years. And now you also have those people that have pretty much become very accustomed to not thinking about student loans because, well, you haven't had to make that $400 a month student loan payment. And so people have naturally changed their lifestyles. Maybe you buy a little bit more, or maybe just lifestyles have changed because of inflation. Life costs have also risen. If now student loan payments restart, 
that is going to change the game for a lot of households where it's going to be another brand new payment out of nowhere that a lot of people are not prepared for or have completely forgotten about, which can pose more financial stress on households. So this is where now we talk about the debt bubble. Interest rates are something you need to pay attention to because interest rates are going to dictate exactly what happens in our economy. And the reason why it's so important is because if the Fed were to start cutting interest rates, inflation will get worse. If the Fed starts raising interest rates even more aggressively, all these debt bubbles start to implode. And this is where now I keep saying that the Federal Reserve Bank is walking this tight wire and they're trying to figure out how do we balance both? How do we bring inflation down without completely pricking this debt bubble? That's what they're trying to do. The problem is inflation has come down, but it's still extremely high. And this high inflation is hurting households. At the same time, they're slowly starting to poke at this debt bubble. And this debt bubble is going to, we're going to start to see a lot more of this in the coming months, in the coming years. But this is where the Fed is trying to do this balancing act. The concern is when you try to make everybody happy, you can anger everybody. And that's what they're really hoping doesn't happen. But this is where you, as a financially smart person, want to be paying attention to this. That way you can understand what's happening. And if you start to see more economic pain, you can then capitalize on opportunities that will come your way. And this is where, number one, you got to be patient. But also, number two, you got to be financially educated and understand this. You want to pay attention to what's happening. That's my goal with Market Briefs is to keep you updated with what's happening when it's happening, that way you can understand the entire situation. But then number three is also prepared because you can be the most financially educated and find the best investment opportunity in the world. But if you don't have the money to capitalize on the opportunity or have access to money to capitalize on the opportunity, it doesn't do you any good. That's where you have to mix one being prepared, but also financially educated together. And that's why you know, I want you to start learning this now Make sure you understand 2023 is not the year for you to go out and finance a new truck. 2023 is the year for you to get financially smart. That way you can capitalize on opportunities that might come your way instead of being the person that gets slapped, blindsided by opportunities that might come your way. Everybody wants to be a millionaire, but that's one of the worst financial goals that you can set for yourself. Not because it's bad to be a millionaire, but because most people have a misconstrued conception of what being a millionaire is. I'll show you. Let's assume that you went out and you bought a home for, say, $200,000, and then a few years go by, and now your home